remember the good old days of like three weeks ago <laughs> when I brought you content about how they really are doing critical race theory in the classroom or rather critical race pedagogy or they were teaching in critical race theory, however you want to put it. Yeah, well, the messaging has changed and now the problem isn't that you're imagining it's there. Now the problem is literally you. You're the problem for opposing it. So how has it shifted? It's shifted to calling you names. Now, if you don't agree with the teachers, the teachers' unions, the school board, whomever wants your kids to be exposed to critical race theory, critical pedagogy, and all of its various woke offshoots, there's something wrong with you. Seems a little different from before when they were working pretty hard to deny it was even happening, which sort of implies that on some level they knew it was not appropriate. Why deny it at all? unless they knew that you weren't going to like it and that maybe you might have a reason for not liking it, a reason other than the fact that you, you know, allegedly are racist. So, I mean, do you really believe that these millions of teachers and all of the members of the teachers union think that all of the parents of all of their students who oppose this are all terrible white supremacists? Or do you suppose that maybe they think that just makes a really good argument? That's my theory, because either they're even more delusional than I thought, or they're just really, really good liars and propagandists. I I'm going to go with that one. But your mileage may vary. So let's see what James Lindsay has to say in today's trip down the Twitter feed. Almost nothing in the support and deflection around critical race theory is real. This should be very alarming. Well, yes. I mean, everything about critical race theory is alarming, actually. So what he does here is he's going through pieces of the Legal Insurrection article, which I brought you back around July 5th or 6th. It uh, detailed the messaging guide that these progressive educators put together to push back against the parent pushback. Now that they were sort of admitting it, agreeing that, well, well, yeah, we're doing it, but what? What was the problem? They put together a messaging guide to reframe what it is, lie about it, and then lie about you and why you oppose it, okay? So just the lies have shifted, that's all. So he's going through this to pull out the relevant parts, and that's what I'm going to do in this video. So in case you don't follow his Twitter feed, you will see it, and of course, you get my commentary in the bargain. If you want to understand the insane flurry of messaging around critical race theory and why it was a distraction that ended up hurting them, you need to read this article. Oh, James, I hope you're right, and I hope it really did hurt them. I'm not convinced. Was this media and activist frenzy organic or itself astroturf? Maybe it's just coincidence, but shortly before the mid-June frenzy, a large coalition of over 300 progressive education and union groups, over a dozen major left-leaning foundations, and a parade of affiliated influencers rolled out a CRT messaging guide with talking points identical to those repeated almost daily by teachers' unions in major newspapers on MSNBC and CNN and in digital media. Whether the message guide was a script being read from or simply reflected a coalescing of tactics and talking points, it's a appearance reflects how organized the messaging against parents has become. Read the messaging guide below. It will all sound very familiar. And I will link to that in the description box. So if you noticed the talking heads, the teachers union officials, even teachers see, saw people on uh, Facebook or Twitter or whatever saying the same things or everyone calling all the parents racist all of a sudden. And he thought, that's weird. They're all saying the same things in unison about people they haven't even spoken to. They just know that there's opposition, but they know why. They know exactly how all these people feel. Yeah, you weren't wrong. It was pretty organized. I mean, or you could believe the other option, which is they just magically coalesced around the same messages, coincidentally. Mm, yeah, I don't buy that. They are an activist group. After all, that's the purpose of a union. The teachers unions, which are a mafia, well, duh, have a lot to do with this, but it's way uglier than that. You have to read this to understand the true nature of the fight against CRT and why pushback seems only to make noise instead of real gains. Money, a river of it. Which is interesting because he says it hurt them. And now he says that the pushback doesn't seem to make any real gains. So I'm not really clear where he's coming from on that, but I'm going to get into, into that at the end of this video because he said something else the other day that I kind of want to challenge. Sorry, James. You know, we love you, but 
I disagree with you about a little teeny tiny thing, but I'll get to it later. All right. So let's take a look at this. NEA comes out openly for CRT. No discussion about the ongoing targeting of parents opposed to CRT would be complete without mentioning the National Education Association, NEA, the largest teachers union in the country. NEA has a budget in the hundreds of millions of dollars. NEA has a budget in the hundreds of millions of dollars and has been firmly behind the push to teach CRT to children in K-12. Those of us who have followed the attacks on parents speaking out against CRT in K-12 know of deep union involvement. We saw it in the attacks on Nicole Solis in South Kingstown, Rhode Island by the local NEA affiliate. But now it's all out in the open. NEA has come out for CRT. Remember when I told you guys last week they hate you? Yeah, they hate you. I, I mean that. Literally. They hate you. You are in their way. If they could take your children away from you and educate them without your involvement at all and put the kids in some kind of a dormitory at night where they could oversee their every thought and their every movement, they would. And you probably should be should be concerned about that, especially with rhetoric coming out of Washington along the lines of, you should report your extremist family and friends. Extremist is now anybody who disagrees with the teachers unions, with the Biden administration, with the FBI, with pretty much anything that isn't coming out of CNN or MSNBC. So that puts lots of us in the crosshairs and your kids too. So just something to think about. Everyone is saying the same stupid thing against the pushback against CRT because it's centrally scripted. This is the same scandal with apparently different but not that different players that just broke in the Southern Baptist Convention with scripted sermons. Sermongate, remember that? Yeah, I remember that, Sermongate. So why have we been inundated with messaging to the contrary, trying to make parent protesters seem like they have invented CRT teaching out of thin air? The answer lies in significant part on message scripting reflected in a message guide produced by a massive coalition of educational groups funded in part by NEA, which has members on the group's steering committee. Now, this is interesting. It says, why have you been inundated with messaging to the contrary, trying to make parent protesters seem like they've invented CRT teaching out of thin air? It's weird because now they've come out for it. So like we invented it, but now they're for this thing that we invented that we were against. Okay. Critical race theory sucks. Very little of its success is organic. Some in the kids, they've managed to reprogram to be little critical racists, but none of the big stuff that reflexively moves it through every corner of society. This is not organic. This is conspiracy. The Partnership for the Future of Learning. The Partnership for the Future of Learning, Future Learning, is a network of 300 organizations and 200 foundations that work together as, a self, as this self-description reflects. The Partnership for the Future of Learning is a network of 300 organizations and 20 foundations that protects, strengthens, and advances education, equity, and meaningful learning and supports the policies and practices that get us there. Meaningful learning. They, the way they use words, it's really, you know... If I didn't despise them so much because of what they stand for, I would have to sit back in awe of their skill. You really, you really have to give that to them. They are masters at turning phrase. Joseph Goebbels would be proud. Okay, moving right along. It is rooted in networks of groomed influencers. It is not organic. As can, ooh, it says, the group has an extensive list of speakers and influencers it uses. The following partners are spokespeople, scholars, influencers, and storytellers who you can request for public-facing opportunities such as media inquiries, interviews, speeches, panels, and written pieces. So they have a whole list of people you can call on to help you out. As can be seen from above, Future Learning is not some small activist group. It's a well-funded, highly organized central hub for hundreds of activist groups, unions, foundations, influencers, and others engaged in progressive educational policy. NEA, which now is openly pushing CRT, is a funder and has representation on the steering committee. Think about that for a second, you guys. NEA, largest teachers union, hundreds of millions of dollars in their budget. And that comes from teachers dues, which comes from your tax dollars. And they contribute to this organization that is full of activist groups and influencers that produced a messaging guide to confuse and thwart you, parents, so that you would have less influence in what's being taught to your children. If that's not creepy, sinister, I don't know what is. I mean, I really want you to sit with that for a minute, okay? Just like let that sink in. They spent money originally derived from your tax dollars to actively work against you and your influence on what would be taught to your children en masse. Not a very specific small subset of you, but all of you, all of you, preemptively. Notice they don't really say anything specific about which parents, which kind of, just 
all parents, like just in case, like they know they're going to get pushback. They know what they're doing is not what parents want. Otherwise, why go to this trouble and why spend all this money? That right there should just raise all kinds of red warning flags. All of the messaging against the pushback against critical race theory is an is as inorganic and manufactured as it appears. You have to understand this. Pushing critical race theory into our schools, churches, boardrooms, etc., is purposed and intentional. That means it has a reason. He is 100% right. I cannot stress this enough. I keep getting into arguments with people on social media like, I just think they're incompetent and they don't know what they're doing. And I think it's really wrong for you to assign so much malice to these people. I mean, never da 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 da, right? Whatever that theory is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, guess what? So let's look at um, what he says here. The Future Learning Messaging Guide. No later than early June 2021, Future Learning published a messaging guide specifically addressing critical race theory and opposition to it in K-12. The introduction provides that the guide is for use by district leaders and legislators to change the narrative about the forms of CRT taught in schools. When it comes to race and politics and education spaces, there have been varying levels of pushback over the years. Recently, these efforts have become more concerted, resulting in state-level policy moves against critical race theory, CRT, in curriculum. Propaganda around divisive concepts, attacks on local districts, and scapegoating of individual educators. This new level of aggression is part of a culture war that is playing out at a national and global scale. District leaders and legislators can change the narrative with attention to racial equity, culturally responsive curriculum, and meaningful learning. There it is again, meaningful learning. Interesting that they call it a culture war. This new level of aggression is part of a culture war. So they call it that too. I've called it that. Lots of us have called it that, but they call it that too. So that at least means to me that they are participating in it. So whether you think you're participating in a culture war or not, they think they are and they think you are. So let's take them at their word, shall we? And maybe fight it to win. All right. How top-down, how scripted, how manipulative. Remember, this is coming in part from the NEA Teachers Union, which lied repeatedly and in opposite directions about the teaching of CRT in very short time frames. It's not an accident. They didn't expect pushback and are scrambling. No, they didn't, which tells you how intensely stupid they are. I mean, I, I, I really don't know. Is it that they are that disconnected from reality? Are they that enamored with their own rhetoric and their own ideas? Are they that incompetent? Like, I mean, I, I, it's it's baffling to me that they didn't expect this pushback. Not to mention the fact that the kids were at home looking at screens for the last year, meaning parents were probably looking over their shoulders seeing what was going on. It's just kind of amazing, actually, that they didn't realize. But anyway, the messaging guide then has top five messages that will sound very familiar. Emphasis added, top five messages. Truth in our classrooms propels young people towards a more united, inclusive, and just future. Notice they say truth. Like they have the truth. Like this is Bible study. It's a school. There is no the truth. Okay. Trust students to talk about what's happening in the world around them. Students. Stu- We're talking about K through 12. Some of these students are seven, eight, nine, 10, even 15. Trust the students to talk about the world around them that they barely have left their home to see for the last 15 months. And then before that, I mean, there are so many marginalized people who barely get out of their neighborhood, we're told, but somehow they're competent to talk about the wider world they've never experienced and, you know, all kinds of life experiences they don't know anything about because they're children. Coordinated efforts to control curriculum come from aggressive right-wing instigators. Oh, wouldn't you love for that to be true, but it's not. Who wants to stop educators and districts from working towards racial equity? Well, I'll give you that. That's true. We do want to stop educators and districts from working towards racial equity because there's no such thing. There's no such thing as equity achieved between races. In other words, we don't measure ourselves as giant groups of people. We measure ourselves as individuals. That's how the standardized tests work. You're not literally as giving the test to a group of people to take all together. You're just looking at the data that way. And if you honestly believe it's a worthy goal to have everybody achieve at exactly the same level across races, like collectively, then I think maybe you need a therapist because that's not likely to happen. It's no more likely to happen than for me to say we need to strive for racial equity on the basketball court. 
That doesn't mean that not every kid can learn based on their race. No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that we measure things individually and you're going to have individuals of different races not achieving at the same level. And if you're going to look at them as giant groups, you're going to see bigger gaps than if you looked at them as individuals. If you look at them as individuals, you'll see very, very small gaps actually. And you'll see big gaps in certain clusters of groups of individuals. And you'll probably find that they have more in common in terms of socioeconomic status, in terms of their learning disabilities, in terms of other factors that have nothing to do with the race. But since we're not looking at it that way, it looks like, oh my God, we have a giant gap across races. And so they want to work towards something that is unachievable. When educators teach the truth, students start to see themselves as part of a bigger story. Yeah, and they get really, really pissed off, which makes them great at activism. Banning conversations about racism in school is a form of censorship. It's also a straw man argument because no one is trying to do that. A shared, honest understanding of the past bridges divides. I'm sure that it does, but that's not what you're trying to do. Okay, that's not at all what you're trying to do. So stop lying. The talking points we've been fighting back against scripted too. It should catch your attention as it started to catch people's attention last summer that an awful lot of what's happening in our society that links to critical theory is scripted and disseminated. Let's take a look. The messaging guide suggests the use of the term culturally responsive education and provides five talking points. Our state district goal is to make sure every student has equal opportunities to succeed in school and has access to accurate, comprehensive, and relevant curriculum. That's the law, that that's literally the law. Like the law, the federal law, the state law. So to say our state district, our state and district goal is to obey the law as it has been since 1964. Just saying, but you know, if you want to keep restating it, like it's some newfangled thing you just invented, go for it. But this is not culturally responsive. This is called legally responsive. This is called legal, just doing the right thing because you have to, because you have no choice. Because if you don't, you will get taken to court because you will be in violation of federal law and state law. I hope I've made myself clear. There is a long and painful history of race and education in our state. Is there? Every state? All the states? Really? They had tons of slavery in Montana? In Washington state? Oregon? Hmm. What was the long and painful history of race there? And what does that have to do with the education system? So have you not since 1964 corrected the long and painful history of race and education? That seems strange. You've had a lot of time and eight years of a black president. Students are ready for systems and institutions to change. Students are ready or the adults are ready? I'm pretty sure we go ask the average six to seven year old, they have no idea what you're talking about. Creating a just and equitable learning environment that embraces the history and experiences of its learners is not only good for students, but also for our communities and our shared future. Blah, 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 word salad, word salad. Okay, again, in the six years or seven years that a kindergartner's been alive, I don't think that they have experienced too much educational injustice even if we're looking at 11th graders or 10th graders, didn't y'all provide that education? Like last year, the year before, the year before that, year before that, you just suddenly decided in the year 2021 that things were amiss? Why not earlier? This just doesn't pass the smell test. Adjust an equitable learning environment? What? Please give us an example of what was an unjust and inequitable learning environment. I would love to know. Because last time I checked, Brown v. Board of Education was a long time ago, and uh, so was the desegregation process. And even if you want to go back to the 70s and busing, that's pretty much been taken care of too. So what exactly are you talking about? We cannot pretend to be race neutral or colorblind if we are ever going to address and account for the inequalities that students of color face. So were we talking about students in general already or now we just talking about students of color and exactly what inequalities do they face? Not what inequalities of outcome do they experience or produce, but what are the ones that they face? Like how are you literally teaching them differently? And why don't you just fix that? Don't do that anymore. How about that? Because if you are doing it, you're violating the law. You don't need to change the experience for all the other students. They shouldn't be punished for your mistakes. And as far as being race neutral or colorblind, those are two different things. Race neutral is literally what the Constitution calls for. It's the law. Let me say it again. It's the law. 
We are supposed to be race neutral. So it's not about pretending to be race neutral. We have to be race neutral, quite literally. And if you're telling me that you don't believe that your educators that you have hired to obey the law and to literally be race neutral are in fact race neutral, then go take those individuals who've demonstrated some kind of propensity to be racial, racially biased and take them off and individually deal with it. But to assume that being race neutral, first of all, is bad because that's what you're saying. That is what you're saying. You're not saying we, we, we're, we can't pretend that we're race neutral. In fact, what they're saying is don't be race neutral. We cannot pretend to be race neutral if we are ever going to address. See, that's different from saying, well, we all have implicit bias. That's not what they're saying. They're saying we can't be race neutral and achieve the things we want to address. They're saying we need to discriminate. That's what that says. Don't let this funky little construction of the sentences change what you hear, because that's what they mean. Many districts around the country have already incorporated culturally responsive curriculum in classrooms. I can't wait to show you examples. That's another video. The result is that students of color are affirmed and validated by having their unique histories and experiences elevated among their teachers and peers. What's so unique about their experiences because they're of color? How do you know that? How do you know that the middle-class black child living on my street has a unique history and experience different from my children? How do you know that based on the color of their skin? Doesn't that make you sound a little racist? How do you know they haven't lived on the street their whole life, gone to the same schools that you know my kids went to? How, how do you know? They haven't been best friends since like birth. How do you know that their experiences haven't been super, super similar, like way more similar than to, for example, the little white child in Appalachia? would be to either of them. You don't know. You don't. Students of color are affirmed and validated. First of all, why should we be affirming and validating people based on their color? Seems kind of weird to me. Seems a little racist. Just saying. Research shows the students who see positive representations of themselves in their curriculum have improved educational outcomes. Can I see that research? Let's show it. Show us that research. This is something that they do all the time to you parents. Research shows and you just go, okay, demand to see it. Who did the research? I think you'll find nine times out of 10, it was done by the teachers union itself, themselves. Okay. For students of color, as well as white students, as well as white students, you know, them. CRE decreases dropout rates and suspensions, increases student participation, confidence, academic achievement, and graduation rates. But we're not seeing that. We're actually not seeing that. You've been using this for well over a decade and we are seeing illiteracy rates rise. We are seeing violence go up in the schools. We are seeing all kinds of problems. About the only thing that's gone down a little teeny tiny bit is teenage pregnancy, but that could have other causes outside of school. But as far as the rest of this, show me the data. Don't take them at their word because it happens to not be true. Okay, moving right along. Honest history, scripted lie, intentional to beat the work of Chris Rufo and me in exposing critical race theory for what it is, which I controversially said months ago was something they never expected would happen. Don't volunteer the term critical race theory. Linked ASO communications messaging guide. The resource resources listed in the future learning messaging guide also link to a related honesty and education messaging guides. Isn't that funny? Honesty and education. That guidance indicates preparation by ASO Communications, which touts its founder's original approach through priming experiments, task-based testing, and online dial surveys has led to progressive electoral and policy victories across the globe. They're literally telling you, we've got really good propaganda, you guys. We've even tested it, that it works. As with the Future Learning Messaging Guide, these appear to be tested messaging points created by professionals. The ASO communications guidance includes some familiar themes, emphasis added, key directives. Seize, this is what I put out in that video last time. Seize the moral high ground and engage on our terms. With attention on education, let's talk about the teaching and curricula we support and desire. This is just code for saying, make them feel stupid and keep reinforcing that you're the teacher and they're not. Ascribe motivations to the opposition instead of unwittingly repeating the opposition in order to dispel their claims, e.g., we're not teaching grade schoolers about XYZ. Talk about why they're attacking curriculum teachers. <gasps> why are you so racist? Bring this back always to what we want as opposed to leaving us on defense against their attacks. Don't volunteer the term critical race theory, an academic concept. The right has co-opted as an all-purpose dog whistle, but when asked directly about it, define critical race theory on our terms as the honest, up-to-date education students deserve. 
except that has nothing to do with what it is. If I've done nothing on this channel, I hope I have educated you sufficiently about what critical race theory actually is and how it manifests in the classroom and critical pedagogy that you know that this is absolute 100% horse manure. So now this meme made out of made out when I accidentally photobombed Lauren Bobert might start making sense to you. If only you knew how bad things really are. So they were making fun. Sound familiar? It was scripted by big interests trying to make sure critical theory, critical race theory stays in the schools and principled opposition looks crazy, mendacious, paid off, and evil. Complete iron law of woke projection strategy. That's something that James talks about a lot. The iron law of woke projection because it's true. <laughs> Everything they accuse you of, they are doing, probably in that very sentence. <laughs> so don't let it bother you when they accuse you of these things. Just know that that's them projecting what they actually are. So you should feel confident knowing that you're standing up to racists. When they call you a racist, you are facing a racist. So don't back down. It also provides sample scenarios to use, including tying opposition to CRT to the big lie about the 2020 election. Oh my God. The big lie is that people opposed to CRT are all right-wing extremist Republicans or Trump supporters or whatever. The parents and other educators and concerned citizens who oppose critical race theory are probably the most diverse group of Americans aligned on any issue in a century. <laughs> I might be exaggerating, but probably pretty close. Sample narrative three, connecting to the big lie. No matter our color or background, most of us believe in handling challenges with integrity, focusing on solutions and reckoning with our past so we can create a better future. But certain politicians are trying to teach our kids to confront problems the only way they know how, lying about it. The same grifters who have peddled lies about our election want to force our teachers to peddle lies about our history, hoping to keep us divided and distracted this is so much projection. I can't even read it with a straight face. Um, so they can take away our freedom to vote and deny us the resources our schools, families, and communities actually need. By joining together, we can make this country where every child, make this a country where every child has an honest education that sets them up for success. And every one of us has a say about the leaders we elect to make key decisions that affect our lives. Notice how they're mostly concerned about who they get to elect, the decisions that affect their lives. But as if that's what sets you up for success is who's in the White House or who your elected officials are. That's how you get success. Who will I put in office to steal the stuff that I need to survive? Because I certainly can't produce it for myself because I can't read. I can't do math. I don't know how to do science. And basically, all I know how to do is go out in the street and scream and yell and make pretty signs. But then I'll get people elected who'll go steal from the productive people who apparently will always exist. They will just always have a motivation to exist. And their children won't be hobbled and you know intellectually bankrupt because of this. No, no, of course. Of course, they will continue to go on and produce things and make sure that I can eat and have heat and bridges that don't fall down. Yeah, these people live in a magical world with everything they need just magically appears and they get to protest all day. All right. This is why we say the activists as teachers are doing critical race theory, even while saying lying, they're not teaching critical race theory. By the way, images three and four are from Solorzano's contribution to a handbook on critical race theory and education to see what he promotes. Included in the future messaging guide was a link to a Google Doc titled CRT Breakdown, which serves as a demonstration of how groups supporting CRT in education see it playing in practice. The messaging guidance provides five principles taught in school that they acknowledge are CRT. The five tenets of CRT in education, Slorzano, 1998, racism is entrenched in the fabric of American society and is intersectional, compounded by class, gender, sexuality, etc. Dominant narratives in education, such as objectivity, meritocracy, colorblindness, and equal opportunity, need to be challenged. That's postmodernism right there. Like everything about modernism and the enlightenment needs to be challenged. They never tell you why. They never tell you why. They just assert it needs to be challenged. So you parents, you need to start thinking about why that might be. The experiential knowledge of people of color is legitimate and crucial to understanding racial inequality as if these are mutually exclusive. Experiential knowledge of people of color can't possibly include objectivity, meritocracy, colorblindness, or equal opportunity. If that doesn't sound racist, I don't know what to tell you. I mean, really, that's kind of crazy. Counter storytelling. Race and racism must be analyzed across many different disciplines, e.g. psychology, sociology, history, science, literature, the humanities, the arts, etc., as well as historically and currently. CRT is committed to social justice and eliminating racism. It is not. It is not. It is committed to entrenching division and racism for the purpose of gaining 
power. It's about power. They are not remotely interested in anything like getting rid of racism. If they were, they wouldn't be saying any of this. If you're looking for a list of CRT-related concepts that may not be called CRT, it's a good list to start with. Now, this is the excerpt from the book. Recently, I received an email from a ninth grade algebra teacher who read the two articles, Solorzano and Bernal 2001, uh, Solorzano and Yasso 2001, and shared them with her students. Here's an excerpt of what she said. Hi, Danny. I taught my math students about the coordinate plane using the forms of resistance theory. I used resistance theory to introduce and provide relevance to the Cartesian coordinate system. I wanted students to understand that the coordinate system can show the presence or positive value of one variable and the absence or negative value of a second variable all in one diagram. This made using the coordinate system with numbers more of a valuable tool and more meaningful for them. They got the idea of negative and positive X with the absence or presence of motivation for social justice and the idea of negative and positive Y with the absence or presence of critique of a Depression. I also had them do some writing about a time they resisted and to place themselves in the coordinate system. We're going to revisit this in March when students are done with their research, Food for Justice campaign in East Los Angeles, and are planning for action so they can decide how they can resist in a transformative way regarding the qualitative data they collect on health. Initially, Dolores Delgado, Bernal Tarayaso, and I were not thinking of how creative and committed educators might use this transformational resistance framework to engage students to, in Freirian terms, read the word and their world. We now know of and speak to many other teachers and students who are using the transformational resistance framework in and out of their classrooms. They're using math to push social justice. Do you see this? And this person, this Daniel Sorozano is like, isn't it wonderful? They're so creative. And we're now doing this with more teachers. So you can guarantee that even in your STEM classes, your child's STEM classes, this is how they think of math. How can we use this to push social justice? How can we do this in Freire, in terms, Paolo Freire, right, by the way, pedagogy of the oppressed. How can we do this to raise their critical consciousness of their own oppression using math? Is that what you wanted when you sent your kids to school to learn math? Uh, me either. Here it is. Here it is. Look at this. Look at this. Letty's figure in progress is so beautiful. Naive consciousness, magical consciousness. Oh my God. Critical consciousness, self-defeating resistance, transformative resistance, not motivated by social justice, motivated by social justice, conformist resistance, reactionary behavior. Oh my goodness. That's I'm, I'm getting the vapors. It's so beautiful. Very organic, very honest. Leftism moves dialectically by creating a distortion of reality that serves its political advantage and then forcing everyone to participate in it while it advances its own interest strategically with compromise support from the opposition, which is why the Republicans are not the people you should be turning to to solve this problem. This is not going to have a political solution. You are not going to solve a philosophical and a cultural problem with politics. Just because the critical theorists are interested in politics and making everything about politics and using it to push back on you and hoping they will stigmatize you, because many of you are not Republicans, by calling you things you don't want to be called, racist, Republican, Trump voter, blah, 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 does not mean that the solution is political, okay? Just just want to share that. All right, so let's take a look. Reframing the issue, the future learning message guide as a section on how to, but here's more. What's the problem with teaching the story of everybody? It's not about blaming someone. It's about understanding each other, a high school student in Oregon. Hmm. Yeah, if only that were true. Do advance a positive vision of education opportunity that centers race. Why though? Why center race? Why racial essentialism? How would this, would this put you off if they say, like, let's just, we just have to do this out of its centered rate. Do lead with an aspirational appeal to shared values, not a stark negative evaluation of the status quo. Explain how it happens before talking about who it happens to more often. But the how it happens is not right either. The unequal outcomes are because of their race. But it only happens to this race. I mean, we kind of heard you the first time, you know, we get it. Do invoke common values, especially interdependence, shared fate, pragmatism, and ingenuity. No, we don't have a shared fate. We don't. Not necessarily. Maybe in your world where you plan to burn everything down and I'm stuck in the middle of your fire, but no, we don't. Ideally, that's the beauty of being individuals and having individual liberty is that you don't have to share in my poor decisions. I don't want to share in yours. And 
that means, likewise, you don't necessarily get to share in my good decisions. Although if I make a good decision and start a business and create jobs and you want a job and you come and I hire you, then guess what? You've shared in my good decisions. But no, I think in a free society, people should be protected as much as possible from my poor decisions by me just staying out of their way. Oh my God. All right, let's keep going. Do remind people of our common belief that everyone deserves to be in an educational environment in which they can succeed and how failures in the system hurt everyone. Well, that is true. That is true, which is why we should abolish the system. Don't focus on the triumphant individual or other mechanisms that exceptionalize or engage in a rhetorical debate around victims versus victors. Um, don't focus on the triumphant individual. See, I'm stuck there because I really think there's a lot of value in focusing on the triumphant individual because any one of those kids could be a triumphant individual or at least an entrepreneur. So I think not focusing on it is actually detrimental to them. You want to show them what could be. No, don't you? Or they just cannon fodder. Hmm, interesting. Don't use edu-speak and policy jargon except to the parents. That's what they are doing, literally. All right. Look at how organic and honest that recommended example is. Source document legal instruction is summarizing. Let's see. Advance a positive vision of educational opportunity that centers race. This is not going to persuade most people. I don't want things centered on race. In a globalizing and rapidly changing world we, world, we owe it to our children to provide a relevant and culturally responsive education. No, we owe it to them to provide them with the skills necessary, one of which is higher order thinking, the ability to solve novel problems. Um, that's what we owe them, not, not culturally responsive education. That equips students with practical skills and conceptual tools needed to address them. Hmm. Practical skills, yeah, but I'm thinking the ability to think is even more important than practical skills. I can have all kinds of tools, but if I don't know what to do with them, what good is it? I have the skills, I have the conceptual tools, but I can't think without someone telling me what to think. It celebrates courageous Black, Latinx, ugh, Asian, Native, Indigenous leadership during, a, really? During every month of the year? That seems to take a lot of time. It's lots of celebration around things that really don't have a lot of meaning. They really don't. I'm going to put a stake in the ground and tell you that it doesn't. It doesn't have any meaning to celebrate all these cultures all the time. It doesn't, it doesn't help the child. It really doesn't. If you want to have yet another generation stuck in their feelings, where they have to be constantly validated and, and, and praised, and, and you think that's good, you think that's how people succeed in life, um, yeah, look around. We have more depression and anxiety and self-harming than ever before. And yet we've spent at least a generation praising kids and giving them trophies for showing up and they want to do more of it, only this time racially based. Things you didn't choose. Things that were accidents of birth. We want to reward you for it. So before it was just, hey, you showed up on time. Yay, here's a trophy. You, you know, you came to the soccer game. Here's a trophy. Now it's you came to the soccer game while black. Here's a trophy. <laughs> I mean, pretty soon the kid's going to realize I had nothing to do with any of this. And this doesn't make me feel very good about myself. It also honestly teaches activists where and how to make attacks against those pushing back on critical race theory. Note, it doesn't say attack these institutions. It says push back should be discredited as astroturf by associating it with these. Attacking the opposition. A key component of the future learning messaging guide is attacking the objecting parents as being part of right wing groups. They know that we're not. I hope you see that. They know we're not, but they're doing it anyway. Who is really behind the attacks? Foundations and institutions like Coke, Heritage, and Fordham are associated with individuals pushing it. So Coke, Heritage, and Fordham are now right-wing institutions? Parents defending education is sourcing stories that target teachers and districts for a map in order to push it? Yeah, because you actually produced this curriculum and taught it in classrooms. Why is it wrong for them to source it? They are defending education. 1776 report, 1776 unites a commission. America first, back to basics, foundational history, love America again, curriculum, also see Turning Point Academy. These are not far right wing groups of people at all, at all, okay? Attacks are made against individuals, against moms who care about their kids and their kids' education, not to mention the communities, schools, nations, way of life, and they are malicious and coordinated by big entities with lots of money, probably following the Alinsky Rule 13. We have seen this play out in Rhode Island where parents defending education has been falsely and maliciously attacked and as local mom Nicole Solis, as as has local mom Nicole Solis as we documented in these posts. And there's all the posts. 
This is Alinsky Rule 13. Pick the target, freeze it, personalize it, and polarize it. Cut off the support network and isolate the target from sympathy. Go after people and not institutions. People hurt faster than institutions. That's why they're calling you names. That's why they are doing everything they are guilty. They're accusing you of everything they're guilty of. They're well-funded, they're well-organized, and um, it's all political, okay? You have to understand what's really going on here. The teachers unions are evil and up to something evil and it's not organic. It's massively coordinated and massively funded and that must be understood. Those of you who object to my use of the word evil, my definition of evil is rejection of reason and reality. When you categorically reject reason, when you say that it is more important to hold power even if it means lying, cheating, stealing, literally oppressing people, ruining their lives to get what you want, if, if that's because you're rejecting reason, you're not making reasoned arguments, you're rejecting the reality of the situation that people are not, in fact, right-wing extremists, they're just concerned about their kids, that's evil. You don't need to have some supernatural component. You just have to be committed to doing something that is objectively false. That's it for your own gain, political gain, personal gain. I don't really care. You just have to commit yourself to doing something you know is false and that is evil. It's intentional. That's the difference between it being evil and just stupid. The role of NEA in driving substantive curriculum. As demonstrated above, the attacks on parents and groups opposing CRT and K-12 follow closely the messaging scripts and tactics prepared by the Massive Future Learning Coalition, sometimes word for word. If we want to talk about AstroTurf, a better argument can be made that those falsely accusing parent protesters of being AstroTurf are in fact guilty of that charge. It is not just one group that produced the messaging guide. It is a highly organized coalition of hundreds of activists and union groups backed by an extensive network of founders of funders, rather, consultants, influencers, and public relation professionals, all part of the coalition. Okay, so that's the thread. And the reason I took you through this entire thing is that I want you to understand that this is no longer about, you know, well-meaning people who are mistaken, um, people you just disagree with, um, a few people, uh, you know, some people who have a political agenda different than yours. This is a coordinated attack on you as parents they are actually working to eliminate your autonomy on many levels this is the first step this is the first step by demonizing you if they could if they were successful with this messaging campaign let's say they are successful with this messaging campaign and the new narrative that it becomes the mainstream narrative um is that everyone who opposes any form of critical pedagogy in the K-12 classroom, especially the public K-12 classroom, is such a bad person, is a racist, extremist liar funded by powerful political interests for the purpose of perpetuating racism and, and inequality and so forth in America. It is just a hop, skip, and a jump. I, I, I know some people are going to accuse me of slippery slope fallacy, but we've already seen with this just in the past month them go from, I don't know what you're talking about to, yes, we must have it in the schools and parents are evil. So we, we've got, you know, and they must all be Trump supporters. I mean, you know, that that's pretty far, pretty fast. So how long before they get to the point where if you oppose critical race theory, you're a child abuser and Therefore, it follows that maybe you should be paid a visit by a social worker. You get where I'm going with this? So now consider what you're going to do. If you put your kids back into the school in the fall and you say, well, I have no choice. I, I got to send them back. So you put them in there. And you say, well, I'll just, I'm going to be very involved. I'm going to go in. I'm going to watch. And I'm going to criticize. And I'm going I'm to raise all kind of red flags. And I'm going to be ready to sue and all these things. Mm -hmm. And you've got to find a lawyer who'll take your case. Now that there's all kinds of pressure and cancellation happening to lawyers who push back on any of this, because you see it's infected every single discipline in our country, journalism, law, medicine, science, it's in all of them, even the military. Okay. So you, you are, you're, you're all tough. You're going to go sue. You're going to, you know, oh, this and that I'm going to, I'm going to push back, but your kid's still sitting in the classroom. Your kid is still in the building or you're bringing them to the building or they see where your kid is. How do you know they're not just going to 
come to your home and say, yeah, we're really concerned that you're raising your child with these really bad messages. And so we're going to be observing you and watching you and, you know, coming to do some visits and stuff. And, and then when you push back on that, how long before they say, no, you can't homeschool because you're under investigation for extremism. So you lost your opportunity to pull your kid out. Now your kid's stuck in their clutches and you have two choices. Calm way down and be super quiet while they continue to indoctrinate your child or what risk making it worse risk. They're going to take your kid away for good because that's their next play. That's their next play. They won't be able to ban homeschooling as fast as they will be able to take children away from parents who complain too much that they can do and that they are likely to do. There are social workers who would love nothing more than to go to your home and find any reason to investigate you or possibly place your child in foster care for its protection, of course. And if you think I'm exaggerating, I am not. They have threatened this to parents who simply wanted their children to walk home alone they want to sign waivers saying, can my kid just walk home without supervision? I'm giving you permission. We live two blocks away from the school. And they have decided that because the parent wouldn't come into the building and sign a little sheet and collect their child and follow all their rules because they're that power hungry, that they were going to report them to family services. Well, look what has come out just in the last couple of days about reporting family members who are extremists. Facebook is warning you not to read things because it might be extremist. And now the FBI is putting a post on Twitter saying, you know, you're the first line of defense if you notice somebody in your family is being extremist. If they're putting together these organized campaigns to attack parents who push back on this, I promise you they will spend money to keep your kids in their clutches. What they can't do is take your kid out of your home and put them in the school if they're not already there. That they can't do. And I'm not suggesting, and this is where I said I disagreed with James. James said, well, what good is homeschooling? You know, homeschooling is not going to solve the problem. If you homeschool, then they're going to just keep on teaching the other kids and the society is still going to, yeah, he's right about that. There will be kids still going to public school and that presents a problem. But we have a two-pronged approach here. First is save lives, individual lives. Save your child. You owe your child. You don't owe society. You owe your child an education and mental health. So get your kid out because then they can't touch your kid and they can't really touch you as easily because your kid's not in there. Then if you want to help those who are still going to the school board, if you want to run for school board, if you want to do certain things to push back, by all means do them, but your child is protected. You can still do those things. Just because you're homeschooling doesn't mean you're like out of the game. And that's where I disagree with him. It's not an either or. But the first order of business is protect your kid. So I'm sorry, James. I disagree with you. It's I do think homeschooling is a solution for individuals. I'm concerned about individuals first. The culture is built off of many millions of individuals. If we don't save these children, we don't have a culture to save. Okay? So we can't, we're not going to save all of them. And we're not going to push back on the schools, even if every single one of us showed up at a school board meeting, they're going to have ways of pushing us out and shutting us up and arresting us and taking our kids from our homes faster than we're going to be able to protect these kids from indoctrination. So I got to look at the individual kid and the individual brain first. So uh, this did run a little bit long. Thank you for sticking with me. I think this is really important information. You need to know how sinister and evil this is. There's no way to shorten or sugarcoat it for you. Okay you need to know. If you find this content helpful, I hope you will consider liking it, sharing it, commenting on it, and subscribing to the channel. It really helps. It helps me produce more content for you. So thank you for watching, and I hope to see you again soon.